Awesome. And I'm going to hold on. There's a couple more. Okay. And I'll be muting everybody. Okay. Welcome everyone to our Wow, we can see you echoing. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Okay, it stopped. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't say a thing for the rest of the night. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to our September 16 members meeting. Our president, Bob, is out vacationing in Rome right now, and I'm going to be running the meeting tonight for the very first time, so patience. The board wants to make a couple of announcements. First off, as you may know, there are some openings on the there are some openings on the board for 2025. We have two members interested and we're hoping for two more. It really doesn't take up a lot of personal time and it's a great way to participate in making PPF fun, interesting and educational for our members. I joined PPF, PPF last summer and in the fall joined the board and it's been a positive experience. So please let us know if you'd like to join the board for next year. Mark, would you like to give us an update on the PPF photo book that you've been organizing for us? Sure, thanks, Don. So the photo book uh, theme is uncommon, so kind of photographing common things in uncommon ways, but you can interpret that as broadly as you want. Right now, I think as of today, we have about 30 people participating. We'd love to see people, more people submit their photos. Uh, you can submit up to four photos. If you need information, you can just uh, email or text me, and I'll be happy to fill you in on the details if you're not sure about that. We uh, have sent out a couple of emails. And we've announced it on our social media. But participate if you can, because it's a lot of fun. It doesn't cost anything. If you decide to buy the book, then you'll have to pay for that. But otherwise, <laughs> uh, it, there is no cost to participate. And if you buy the book, you're buying it for a cost. We don't make any money off it. We're selling it for what it costs us. So hopefully more people are going to get involved and we can uh, get uh, like 30, 40, 50 people in there. The deadline is next Sunday. So be sure to send me your photos before then. And also send a little statement about uh, your work. Thanks, Don. What is going on? Looks like it's Carol's. You, Don, you oh. need to mute mute everyone. Oh. oh, I did mute all. Everybody's muted. I I oh was my, using I my phone and my. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Mark. I did see this photo book he's been working on, and it's beautiful, and I'm excited to see it, and I hope everybody sends a picture in, or several pictures, four pictures. Okay, next up, um, we have an outing in October, and Joe, would you like to talk a little bit about that and how we can sign up? Sure. We, on October 5th, we've been invited by the uh, National Psoriasis Association to help cover their uh, fundraiser that they're putting on. It's going to be at the Oregon Zoo, and we'll meet there about 1130. Uh, the event goes to two. And um, if you're not a member of the zoo and want to spend more time at the zoo, if you register just with them on their site, um, you can get a free pass to the zoo as well. But um, I, I know most of us have had in invitations to photograph events or things that we've been associated with. And this is, uh, this is a really good opportunity to support a good cause as well as, um, and we have some pretty specific outlines on what we're going to do exactly. So um, I think it'll be very educational. It should be pretty fun and then you can go out and take pictures of the zoo if you wish after the event. So it's posted on the website, uh, on the outings page, uh, events page, and then, but uh, contact me, joewittington at gmail.com, and um, I can send you a detailed 
prospectus on exactly what we're going to do. Hey, that's great. Thanks, Joe. I, for one, have signed up for that, so I'm looking forward to it. Any opportunity to go to the zoo is good for me. I love animals, which is great for tonight, actually. So, um, do any of the other board members have something they want to add or anybody else? All right. Uh, one of our members, Jan Eckloff, is on the board of the Nature Photographers of Pacific Northwest Group. She asked if we would share a flyer of an upcoming event. I will share my screen to show you the flyer and then proceed with the slideshow. September's photo challenge is animals, pets, and wildlife. We had some really great animal pictures sent in by 21 members, and there are a total of 93 images in the slideshow. And it takes about 14 minutes. I do apologize for the annoying music. I was having a bit of trouble with the royalty free stuff. So it's going to sound even worse than Bob's, but you can always turn your volume down. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to share a screen. Uh, oh, by the way, um, Sorry, just for a second. I wanted to make sure that that horrid music was going to play, but I don't see that on the share screen. Oh, never mind. Got it. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I could just feel the answer coming. You're probably just all waiting. Whoops. Um, are you guys still there? Oh, you're on my screen. Yes. Sorry, I'm yes. just being, like totally weird. Okay. Okay. First off, this is the flyer. It's a biannual meeting on November second, and Moose Peterson is a professional wildlife photographer, and he will be talking about bird photography and critter stories. There's also digital and print competitions at the University of Portland, and you can attend um, remotely via, uh, via Zoom. Um, there's a photo field trip to the Gorge and a reception with the speaker. I will type in the address into the chat. Um, and this flyer is up also on our Facebook page. So uh, thank you, Jan, for sharing with us. And I hope people do attend this very interesting looking um, event. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. All right, let's see what we do with the animal slideshow. Let me just take a second. All of these look so great, you guys. I just I, When you're looking at it live on a real screen, it looks really good. I know Zoom kind of blurs things out a little bit, but your pictures are just so amazing. I was very impressed by them. Oops. On story, naturally, I want to start on the right one. I mean, it was close. I had this all set up. <laughs> Never fails when you're all prepared. Uh, yeah, for sure. I sat here half a day practicing this. Okay, now we can go.
Okay. You guys are such skilled photographers. I was so impressed with your pictures. I mean, I was just like, oh, you know, animals, my favorite thing. And you just like did such an amazing job. I'm in awe. Okay. Um, as you saw at the end of the slideshow, next month's photo challenge is elements, anything, earth, air, water, fire. Okay, it is member speaker night. Tonight we'll be hearing from four members who have been recording images of Oregon forests, both before and after the massive wildfires of recent years. Three of them, Jim Congleton, uh, Susan Turner and Michael Bryan have been photographing at Opal Creek, especially the areas around Job, Jawbone Flats and the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center. They were invited to visit and photograph the aftermath of the fire by the nonprofit to record photos that would show Oregonians the conditions after the Beachy Creek fire of late summer 2020, as the whole area has been closed off to visitors and will remain closed. Uh, at least for a few more years. They had visited and photographed before the fire, as did several other members of PPF, and then went back on September of 2022 and June of 2023. So the photos we will see tonight will document the ancient forest we had been familiar with and the aftermath of the fire. Jim, Susan, and Mike were able to visit because one of the cabins at Jawbone Flats survived the fire and has become a busy research center, hosting scientists and researchers. They will also give us, <laughs> excuse me, they will give us a brief update about plans to rebuild the education center at Jawbone Flats. The fourth member, Larry Thompson, is using photography to illustrate the effects of climate change on our forests in the Western Cascades. According to a 2023 report from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, rising temperatures, declining snowpack, and frequent droughts are all leading to a dramatic surge in wildfire frequency and severity across the Western United States. Climate change is loading the dice, transforming what was once a cycle. Oh my gosh, I can't pronounce this. Cyclic and seasoned visitor on the landscape into an omnipresent threat. His project is a collaboration with scientists from the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, Oregon State University, and the Native Fish Society. If any of you have any questions or comments, please hold them until the end of all the presentations, or you can write your questions in the chat and I can read them for you if you like at the end. Okay, Mike, would you like to share, excuse me, share your screen? Uh, we'll share the screen in just a second. I just wanted to point out that the three of us are all together here because we worked on the project together. So we decided we would do one slideshow and we'll be kind of jumping back and forth between the three of us to look at our respective images. Mm -hmm. So just, just want to let you know that that was about to happen. Yeah, so it's two presentations, not four. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna do the magic share screen. I hope that I do this right for a change. <laughs> yeah. Desktop, yes. Okay. okay, now is everybody seeing that? Getting there. Huh? Are we, are we, I'm just not glad you're you seeing it. What? There. Donna, are you seeing the screen okay? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to add to what. Don said in an introduction that PPF has also had a long time connection with the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center in that members have donated uh, the reproduction rights of photographs for the nonprofit to use in their communications. And several of us have donated prints that they've sold at fundraisers 
Um, my connection with Opal Cake goes back to the late 80s when my business partner and I at the time produced a video about what was about to be logged and got involved in the uh, the effort to save Opal Creek from being logged and eventually, you know, turned into a wilderness area. Um, and some of the other members were also involved in all that. So this 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 place has kind of a long history with our group. This is the, this is the view uh, from the distance when you're coming up the access road. Opal Creek is over there where that hill and the distance is. Um, and I didn't know what to think about what was going to happen up there because this is this is the experience that I had had over the years. This was kind of like my personal cathedral of going up there and seeing what a beautiful place that it was. Um, so I was kind of bracing myself for the fire. Um, and the first time we went up in September, it was even worse than I thought. Um, but it did spare parts of Jawbone Flat. So we've been able to talk with you a little bit about what's gonna happen with all that at the very end of our presentation. I didn't know anything about Opal Creek before we got invited up there. Uh, it was really kind of a hidden gem and uh, people have often described it as such. But after the thousands of Oregonians got involved in saving it, and then the education center started their programs up there, a lot of people from Oregon came to Opal Creek. Um, so the nonprofit was also thinking about us taking these photographs and uh, the, uh, after the fire and adding them to the ones that we had made before the fire to give people a general idea of what conditions are and what they're facing with the, the rebuild. The other th characteristic of Opal Creek really was the water. <clears throat> and um, I kind of started out shooting water like this where I'm being a good uh, trail walker and you know trying not to go down to the stream, break anything down to cause any damage. Um, and the water could be a little scary when it was high like this. You didn't want to get into it because it might be bad. Uh, but there were many times in the summer when the water had dropped and you could actually walk in the stream and you had this magical interplay of the light and the water and the stone and it changed constantly. So it was like everywhere you looked, you were seeing these masterpieces that nature would create like this. So here's an example of how the ripples, I hope you guys can see it on your screens. The ripples are, are capturing the blue light from the sky above and turning it into the blue flashes in the image. So we, if you imagine standing there looking at this, you were getting a constant changing play of these blue flashes. Um, and I had a wonderful experience at this pool one afternoon. I was completely covered in angle wing butterflies. Um, and I found out from a friend later on that I had just accidentally been in a lek where um, the, the boy butterflies showed off and the girl <laughs> butterflies chose their mates. But at the time, I kind of took it as, you know, this is my welcome to the forest. So for me, this was this was a, just a really special part of life. Um, and I was I was worried about the fire. So we'll get to that and we'll, sh and we'll show you. Um, but at this moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan and she's gonna share photos that she had taken uh, before the fire. Okay, my photographs are from um, my only visit to Opal Creek before the fire. And that was in uh, mid-October of 2015. Uh, a whole bunch of us went up there and, and spent one night. Um, after living in, in Portland for 10 years, Opal, the Opal Creek Wilderness Area is still my favorite place in the Pacific Northwest, and that includes before, obviously, and after the fire. It was a joy being there, um, especially since I hadn't been in an ancient forest for many years. These first two pictures are from a bridge at, Opal, at the Jawbone Flats, and you'll see more pictures from the bridge later. Now, on the first trip, I palled around with Mike and one of his friends who came to visit, but I also had precious time um, all alone in the forest. 
these are vine maples and an, an old sawmill shed or a shed in a sawmill area that is no longer exist. Um, actually before the fire, it was, it was torn down by uh, visitors or hikers who wanted uh, to, to, to get firewood. One of the things with these pictures is I think it shows you that even in black and white, the forest was very lush. This is the Kopetsky Trail that ran a lot above along the Santium River. So you could walk from where the previous hut was along and up above the river in, into Jawbone Flats and cross another bridge. Uh, more vine maples, which are wonderful. Another view from the Kopetsky Trail. This, um, this is just a minor shed that was at Jawbone Flats. Of course, it's, it no longer exists. And these are more vine maples. And I think this remains my favorite um, uh, nature picture um, that I've, well, that's all I've done in, in, um, in the Pacific Northwest, but this is my favorite still. And by the way, I'm I'm actually a pers a people photographer, so I'll hand it over to Jim now. Oh, after the fire, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're already going into after the fire. Okay. Cool. I, I wanted to start my uh, talk off by talking a little bit about the philosophy behind the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center. Um, <clears throat> I found this project to be really engaging because for several reasons. One, it's a challenge to go into an area that's undergone the kind of devastation. And you'll understand that better when you see some of the after fire photographs. Um, and to make art, uh, artistic photographs. Uh, it also has provided an opportunity to work along with Mike and Susan. And of course, they're both keen observers and accomplished photographers. And finally, it is very satisfying to use, to find a way to use photography to support a cause like this. And that cause is to introduce young people who might not otherwise have the opportunity to an experience of wild nature in a direct hands-on way. That is the primary purpose, as far as I can tell, of the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center. When I first visited Jawbone Flats in 2015, uh, uh, when uh, the visit that Susan just referred to, uh, uh, along with other BPF members, I was unfamiliar with the aims and activities of the Opal Creek Ancient Fire Center. Um, and But when I later started to learn more about it, uh, learn more about the aims and activities of the center, I found they were part of a national and international movement that was given form and impetus by a 2005 book by Richard Louvre, Last Child in the Woods. Now this book has been reprinted numerous times, translated into nine languages. And as recently as 2015, I don't have any more recent data, it has sold 350,000 copies. It seeded the ground for new programs to introduce young people to wild nature throughout the US and also in other parts of the world. The core message of this book is that for the first time in human history, Children are growing up disconnected from the natural world with deleterious consequences for the children and for society. Uh, one of the primary causes for this disconnection, as we all know, is the shift to computer screens for socialization and games playing rather than sharing outdoor explorations with other children. And, you know, I see my, my grandchildren spending many afternoons in their rooms um, socializing, if at all, only via the screens. Today, providing opportunities for young people to directly engage with nature and particularly with wilderness is the primary aim, as I said earlier, of the Ancient Forest Center. Uh, Deb Marchin, Merchant, a consultant for this center that we've uh, worked with some, described the importance of the center's work and the role that photography can play in an email exchange with Mike. She said, 
the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center has a tremendous opportunity to tell stories about resilience, recovery, research, collaboration, and collective action, climate change and human resilience, and finally, rebuilding Jawbone Flats. These are the kinds of stories that when told in a narrative have impact and when mirrored in images, those narratives reach hearts and minds. PPF members have supported the Ancient Forest Center's work in various ways, and I'll just mention two before I go on to the slides. If you missed it, read Pat Rose's excellent detailed write-up in Oregon Art Art Walks Art, excuse me, Arts Watch, September 2023. She gives she gives a brief history of the decades-long political battles and maneuvers that finally led to the establishment of the Opal Creek Wilderness and the Opal Creek National Scenic Recreation Area in 1996. And EPF member Michael Bryan was there from the beginning. He has been supporting the protection of Opal Creek's old growth forests and the work of the Ancient Forest Center with his photography for almost four decades. A truly remarkable con contribution <laughs> and accomplishment. Make me sound old. <laughs> yeah, well, you started very young. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, 14? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, diapers. Okay, so this is what uh, the Opal Pool area looks like now, or at least it did two years ago, uh, two, and this is two years after the fire. Um, anybody who's been up there has, has been to the site, although you might not recognize it. The stanchion that held if the uh, end of the bridge on the far end of the bridge uh, over Opal Creek is, is visible right in the middle of this photograph, and Opal Pool would be downstream just a little bit to the right. That's right in the camp. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, for Anyone listening who might be photog photographing up there, following up in five or 10 or 15 years, uh, this would be a, a good uh, reference point to try to return to over time because it it, it is um, the, the most famous area of Opal Creek. It's visited by so many people. And the stanchion, of course, provides a, a reference point. Uh, it's gonna change a lot, of course, over future years. Uh, this is a picture, of obviously, the burned forest. And uh, when we walked past this, it, it was like looking through a window of the uh, framed uh, younger trees that had been totally stripped of bark, uh, framed by the some of the older trees that had more resilient bark that was still charred. Of course, those trees were dead. Uh, this is a slope on the way on the road uh, to uh, the center. Um, gives a pretty good idea of the, of the nature of the destruction. Um, and you see most of the bark's burned off. It's starting to peel off on the north side of some of the trees. This was a bright spot, um, <clears throat> some regrowth. Um, Close to, to Jawbone Flats on the way out to the to, to the pool. Um, Mike, Mike tells me this is um, at least in part fireweed, which is one of the very first colonizers to regrow after a fire. This is the bridge that anyone who's been to Jawbone Flats would be familiar with. Uh, the bridge no longer exists. Um, of course, it was charred from end to end, and it's, it's been replaced this, this summer. Uh, interesting that how the fire sometimes seems to to rage, blow in a almost in a horizontal fashion. So the, it it completely charred the bridge, but some of the trees on both sides uh, were not damaged too much. Um, detail of the bridge. Some of the burned trees uh, we call ghost trees uh, that are evident uh, all along the road. This is uh, Bad Lax Creek, and uh, you can't really see any damage in this photograph, even though it's post-fire. But Bad Lax Creek, for one thing, didn't really 
suffer the damage that the uh, Upper Creek watershed did. So a lot of that area, which is up in the Upper Creek wilderness, uh, was burned spotily or not at all. Um, one of the things that was always, I think, uh, uh, an attraction for photographers about Jawbone Flats was all the, the old mining equipment scattered around. And I couldn't resist uh, taking a few photographs of that while I was there. Um, this summer, they're, they're cleaning up all the, the burned uh, buildings and, and probably some of this, uh, this leftover equipment. So I don't know what they're going to leave. It's another uh, sort of abstract shot that uh, leftover equipment. Uh, this photograph uh, is almost funny, except of course it isn't because of the circumstances, but I think it, ironic is probably the best word to apply to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is a photo of Bad Lakes Creek. Uh, of course, the Opal Creek and Bad Lakes Creek come together right at Jawbone Flats. Um, and this picture actually was taken before the fire, but this watershed was not burned very much. And I, so I don't know if it looks exactly like this now, but it's probably much the same. And I'll pass it on to Susan. Okay. Um, the Beachy Creek fire began on August 16th of 2020, two miles south of Jawbone Flats. Um, because of the terrain, it was essentially impossible to fight the fire. People could get in and have a look and get out, but it was too dangerous to even attempt firefighting. Then on September 7th, there was an, an historic windstorm wind that caused the fire to spread very quickly towards the west. In the end, 194,000 acres were burned. Um, this is similar to Jim's picture looking, um, let's see, this would be a, looking across Opal Creek from Jawbone Flats. And I thought it was just pretty amazing. Um, this is the same picture just for the fun of it. I converted it very quickly to black and white without any touching up. Um, when we got to the, um, when we got to Opal Creek, exactly two years after the fire, um, we were in the middle of a, a destroyed ancient forest. It was shocking and deeply sad. I thought not only about what Opal Creek had been, but also about the future of the world's forests. Mike was probably the most traumatized, surely because of his long history there and contribution to saving the forest from loggers. This picture was taken very close to the other pictures on our first visit and our first visit after the fire in 2022. And this gives you a good sense of the destruction. This one's included simply because I like it. One of the things I like to do is to try to make beautiful photographs and vi visual sense out of visual chaos. And mm -hmm. as traumatic as traumatic as the area was, we were just able to kind of distance ourselves a bit from the trauma and try to take some good pictures. The, the, the first pictures were taken on the first day when we returned to Fo Opal Creek. And this is the first evening after the fire. These, these pictures were taken on the, the second afternoon. We had one full day at Opal Creek, which was wonderful. So we had 48 hours to try to figure out what to do. These, this is a good shot of uh, fireweed, late, very late afternoon. This is the same area walking back. Now this is, this is up above Battle Creek. If you can get from Jawbone Flats through about a hundred meters of, of 
fallen trees and brush and just kind of climbing over and under, you get to a trail that's, that's actually pretty clear and very beautiful. And this area was not as heavily burnt. This is the same area. I, I was intrigued by the interesting light. You can see even, even two years after the fire late summer, there is some green. This is also near, obviously, near Jawbone Flats. This is the, the third day. In the afternoon, we were walking out from um, Opal Creek to where the old parking lot was. There was no way to get a, to get a large vehicle in over the road. This is looking down the Centium River from the Kopetsky Bridge, which is still, which was still standing well enough to, to walk over, but you couldn't get into the forest after the bridge because of all of the fallen trees. This is walking further along the road, obviously in the afternoon. Then we got in our cars and, and a few miles from the parking lot headed towards, you know, the main road. Um, we stopped to take some, some late afternoon pictures. These are um, alders growing in sort of a, um, like a above, a, above a little creek. This is looking back towards Opal Creek, not in the picture, but in that direction. And, and you can see on the left, the road that we were able to drive over. This is another shot from the same place. You can see there's a touch of green and there's also oddly some uh, patches of trees that weren't burnt or weren't ver burnt very badly in the, saddle at, in the saddleback. And we always hear that fire moves upward but there are definitely areas high up that didn't burn or didn't burn badly. This is looking back at the road. <clears throat> Standing in the same spot, looking in another direction. Um, all, all of these are from the road. Here you can see it was getting late enough in the afternoon to get some wonderful uh, shadows. I have just a couple of pictures comparing um, the first visit, 2022, same spot, second vision, visit 2023. Not much of a change yet, but these pictures are only about seven months apart. Same thing. This is walking out to the bridge that that uh, Jim photographed very early in the morning. This is walking the same trail um, a bit later in the morning. It's greener, but that ha also has partly to do with the fact that this is this is late late spring, and the other picture was uh, late summer. This is the, the bridge at Opal Creek, looking up Battle Axe Creek. Um, this, is, this is the next visit in the, in the spring, looking um, from this, basically the same spot, looking up Battle Axe Creek. And here are just a few shots after the fire. This is Thimbleberry. And um, the, the old vehicles and mining equipment survived the fire. More, more survivors with some bracken fern. This is all very close to, uh, jo this is Jawbone Flats. I included this because it, it gives a contrast to the water, pre-fire and post-fire. And there seems to be a lot more algae and growth in the water, probably due to um, 
increased minerals, and a lot more sun. Just another shot going again, going in the area out towards the bridge where Jim photographed. More. The second visit, um, Mike and I were there for barely 24 hours, but I think we had a better handle on what we wanted to photograph. This is along the road, and I think it looks a bit greener, a bit more low plants on the ground than the, than the previous trip. And this is also from along the road going out to the highway. Okay, Mike. So after the fire, uh, when we went up there, we realized there had been uh, somewhat of a miracle at Jabon Flats. Um, this shot is taken, you probably recognize from the meadow, looking past that little mining equipment and, and Jabon Flats is a little bit in the distance and down to the left. But you can see that right around Jabon Flats was a mosaic burn. And a, and a lot of things actually survived. Uh, Jim had pointed out earlier how the bridge itself had been torched, but the there's a lot of greenery on both sides of the stream, Battle Axe Creek, uh, right around the bridge. Um, <laughs> this I really liked because um, it's a fireweed growing out of a dead tree, which for some reasons I really appreciated as you know early signs of life. <laughs> And, the, and that was true everywhere you looked. Um, the, Jim was photographing uh, in much better than I did, the, the sort of the wreckage of all the detritus around there. Uh, but everywhere you looked, you would see new life. Um, this is my favorite example because the fire was so hot at uh, that building that had uh, the, the little cafe in it, the commissary. It was so hot that it melted the glass that was in that building. Uh, and yet here's a fire week starting out of it. That's a cool picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other plants, Susan already pointed out, because there's no canopy anymore, all the things that grew close to the ground, the ferns, bunch berries, the bear grass, all of that is really thriving now. It's getting a lot more light and it's getting all the nutrients because the fire killed most of the trees down to the roots. That's why so many of them have already fallen over. This is the confluence uh, that some of you probably remember where uh, Battle Axe Creek is coming down from the left. You could walk from Jabo Flats down a little lane here at this point. And that's Opal Creek straight ahead uh, coming towards us. And from here down, it's the little North Fork of the San Am. But all along these banks, you would see green. So a forester friend told us um, the forest knows how to recover. And it, we really saw that when we were there. So that was a big help recovering from the shock. Now the question that Larry's gonna talk about is um, it knows how to recover, assuming that oh, climate change lets it happen. Mm -hmm. This shot I took uh, when we were coming out just because, um, again, I really appreciated these signs of life in that otherwise, you know, vast burn forest back there. And then I had been up there before and was able to put shots together from more or less the same place. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start here with the bridge, now gone. Um, but imagine that we were standing on the bridge uh, and we were looking down Opal Creek. So that's what it looked like uh, before the fire and from almost the same spot, the bridge isn't there anymore. That's the view now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that in, in here, the fire was so hot, it actually shattered the rock. You have to be really careful along the edges of the stream because it'll just crumble. Uh, and yet Jawbone Flats survived. This is the view from the same bridge looking the other way down towards Opal Pool. Probably a lot of you Opal Creek photographers are remembering um, taking these shots and hanging around these rocks when we were up there on our trips. Um, but this is what it looks like now. Um, nice, nice comparison. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
this was a, a shot in the autumn. That's why there's no bees on the alder trees there. But it's taken from that same bridge that Susan was talking about. Mike Kopesky was the our congressman from Oregon who got the House of Representatives to vote for the Opal Creek Wilderness, and then Senator Hatfield got it passed through the Senate. Uh, so that's why his name is on this bridge and the and the trail. So this autumn shot before the fire, here's the same view, because that bridge is still there after the fire. We must but, have been standing side by side. <laughs> well, I see our shadows down there, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah. Um, and then I went up there one time and got stuck in the snow in my truck. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, as long as I'm stuck in the snow, I might as well take a photograph. So I photographed these alders because they, I thought their color looked so great against the, the snow backdrop. So I knew where these alders were and I photographed them <laughs> after the fire. These are the same trees. And then this photograph, many of you will recognize on the road up to the uh, trailhead, this big grove of um, Douglas fir trees. You kind of get an idea of the scale from that couple that's walking toward us. And then here's the same spot that Susan, uh, when we were walking up on our, our second trip, and so the, all the trees are completely burned, but the fireweed and all the other uh, plants that are on the ground are thriving. And then this is a kind of a cheesy photograph I took, uh, but I'm using it because <laughs> it has both cabin four and cabin five in it. So you kind of get an idea what they look like before the fire. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So here again, cabin five was completely destroyed. That's all that's left is the foundation and the roof metal. But cabin four has not got a scratch on it, literally. And so cabin four is the only place that you can stay in Jawbone Flats. And that's why it's become the research center. Uh, and people are, are studying the recovery of the forest. And this, that includes photography. They're doing this systematic research photography where they'll take like a plot and photograph it, the same plot over time. And they've set up trail cameras to document the return of birds and animals uh, into the area. Uh, so we get to come up there when there's space at cabin four. So that's why we've only been up there twice and we're gonna get to go again in a few weeks. So here's your intrepid photographic <laughs> crew on the spot. That's Susan working that road. Here's Jim at Battle Axe Creek. <laughs> um, and here's me. Thank, thanks for that photograph, Jim. Um, so I just wanted to wrap this up with uh, kind of a, what's going to happen now. Um, the nonprofit to keep going moved, they, they kept the, the outdoor schools going, but they moved them to other places like Silver Creek Falls in that park. They've been holding uh, outdoor school there and Klamath Falls and a couple of other places around Oregon. And they've actually expanded. They have more kids in those programs than they used to when they were just at Opal Creek. So they might keep that going. Uh, they had to go through a long discussion with the federal government for FEMA to decide that they were a school um, and to then give them a grant of uh, the federal assistance for rebuilding the education center. Uh, they had to wait on the Forest Service. That's another reason we've only been up, up there episodically because the Forest Service had to rebuild the, the bridges that burned on the road and the road itself. Um, and the Forest Service, as you can imagine, had other priorities on their hands, the continuing fires and helping people like in the towns along Highway 22. So this is this has taken a while to happen. Um, and while you can't get in there, they've been doing their planning for how are they gonna clean the site out um, and how will they rebuild you know that before it was a mining camp that was adapted into being an education center. And <clears throat> it wasn't the best setup for having groups of people stay there. So now it'll one advantage of this burning everything down is you get to start over and design it the way it should have been in the first place. Um, and when that's all done, then they'll restart the education program. So Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center, still alive and kicking, still going. Uh, you don't hear from them much because they're in this, this long-term process of figuring out how to recreate the, the education center and talk about the recovering forest rather than the ancient forest. But as Jim pointed out, I, I want to say I've been up there when the kids would come in on a Friday and they're, you see them walking along the road and they're really bored because their phones don't work up there. 
Thank and, goodness. And um, by th that would be a Friday afternoon. And by Sunday afternoon, they are completely transformed. They're excited. They are talking to each other. They're making all these discoveries. They're picking up salamanders. They're looking at mushrooms. They're learning about the forest and the life of the forest in ways that they only could learn by actually being there. And so it's, uh, it's always been really exciting to see this change that happens just within a couple of days and kids in the forest. Okay, that's it. Move my magic mouse. Oh, wonderful. Great. Okay, so then we're going to hear from Larry. Did I unshare my screen? Yeah, unshare the screen and then. Yeah, if you could unshare, I'll get started. Unshare. Well, I'm clicking back to meeting and nothing's happening, so. Don, you might be able to stop and share. Oh, that's right. I can, can't I? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I remember seeing that somewhere. Well, I apologize, but I haven't had this happen. I'm I'm seeing the Zoom workplace screen, and I'm clicking on back to meeting, but nothing's happening, and I don't. I've lost my share. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I'm. Uh, okay. Okay. There you go. No. <clears throat> okay, so um, Don, I'm okay to get started here. Yes. Okay, terrific. Uh, so thanks, uh, Mike, Susan, and Jim. Those are wonderful photographs and some really important concepts. Um, before I get started, uh, when we saw a lot of these uh, photographs, what you saw are uh, burn trees, uh, the trunks and the branches and so forth, and a whole lot of fireweed. Um, the central question is, four years later, this is what we have. So if we think about something like a Douglas fir, a Douglas fir takes something on the order of 20 years to start producing seeds and 80 years to reach maturity. So the question becomes, can the Douglas fir and other, all the other sorts of uh, beneficial uh, uh, trees actually regrow before the fireweed takes over, before we wind up with a bunch of shrubland? So, the question that's on the mind of a lot of scientists here um, is what's going to happen to the forest? Do we go back and get what we had, which is the, the wonderful growth, or do we wind up with a bunch of scrubland? And there is not an answer at this point. There's a lot of research trying to figure that out, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of concern about how the forest is actually going to recover. So... Um, in terms of my project, I'm really focused on how the forests will recover, what's the current condition of them, how they'll recover, what the various groups are doing to understand that and help. Um, I think Don mentioned I've been working for almost two years now with folks from the Bureau of Land Management in Oregon, the U.S. Forest Service in Oregon, uh, various researchers from Oregon State University, and the Native Fish Society. So what I'm trying to do with the project is understand and then communicate uh, sort of where the forests are now four years down the road and what's the outlook. So I'm trying to do that photographically. There's actually a narrative that goes with this project so you can read about each of the pictures. And there's also a three minute video. Uh, it was a drone vi uh, video uh, that I hired someone to fly his very expensive drone through some really burnt out areas and right along the water level in the various streams and rivers. So, so that's the scope um, of the project. Um, I've really focused on seven major uh, wildfires from 2020 to 2023. So the Labor Day fires of 2020, um, we'll talk about those as well as in, uh, 2023, we had the lookout fire, which was uh, also a major concern. 
So I think the question for me is with all the with all the devastation, with the slow regeneration of the forests, what do future generations see? Um, will there be uh, trout and salmon running up the rivers? Will there be various uh, forms of bird life? I'm particularly concerned about the northern spotted owl, uh, given that the barned owl is now coming in and taking uh, taking away a lot of their habitat. So that's really the concern. Um, this photograph is from the Riverside Fire, um, south of Estacada in Oregon, uh, 123,000 burned acres along the Clackamas River. Um, when you look at this photo from a science and ecology perspective, it's very, very important. So what you're seeing is what it looks like, right? There's a, a fair amount of very healthy green trees, but there's a whole lot of burnt trees. So the fire went through here. Some of the areas were spared, others uh, were not. This is a concept called fire refugia, where the scientists are trying to figure out how can the healthy parts of these forests help the unhealthy parts or the burn forest uh, regrow. So a lot of uh, effort is going into this, thinking there may be ways to, if not accelerate the recovery of the forest, at least inform various uh, forest management practices such that it takes advantage of, of what is there uh, and that is live. Um, so uh, this forest, like all the others, you know, the, the climate has become much drier, hotter, and that just creates hugely combustible fuel, meaning branches, leaves, you know, trees, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's from a climate perspective, that trend will continue. Um, so from the period 94 to 2005, I believe it was about 18% of the fires here in the Western Cascades were considered severe from the 2020 fires. It's 38%. So more than twice as many of the fires uh, are classified as severe fires, which really means the forest may not recover. Um, so this is uh, Riverside. You'll see more pictures as we go. Um, this is Beachy Creek, uh, the same fire that devastated Jawbone Flats and uh, Opal Creek, a uh, different area. It's not, not the same area. But one of the things you'll notice is there's quite a, not, quite a lot of pyrophytes here. So the pyrophytes um, sometimes called fireweeds, are uh, vegetation that grows, which actually loves fire, believe it or not, it grows very quickly after a fire. The fire actually warms the soil in some ways that perpetuates and enhances the growth of these, uh, uh, of these particular weeds. So the question becomes, well, if all we have on the ground is weeds, how do the trees, uh, if they start to grow, how do they propagate their seeds and um, allow for other, uh, for additional trees to grow? So, so that's the issue. Um, this used to be a campground. It's not a campground anymore. It's closed, um, as a lot of them are, and uh, and you'll see as we go through. This is the Holiday um, Farm fire from 2020. Um, 166,000 uh, acres were were burned. So the Bureau of Land Management took me up in these uh, uh, forest roads. Uh, it's actually quite frightening to go on these roads because you'll be driving on the road. You can see it's not you know much of a road. And then you'll have these uh, uh, sort of extreme drop-offs. The problem with that is the soil and the roads are unstable. And they're unstable because there are no trees in this picture in the upper right, there are no trees or significant vegetation to hold the soil back from, from erosion. Um, and you'll see from time to time, you know, the soil will just start eroding. It'll overrun roads. It'll clog rivers. It does all kinds of unhelpful stuff. Um, the other thing about this picture is I've been really trying to show the scale of these fires. So it's just really difficult for me looking at you know, 100, 200 trees 
to understand really how big of an issue is this. So this picture to some extent shows that you can see the, you know, the properties all the way in the background, you know, there's, there's no healthy trees there. Um, this is another way to show the scale. Um, um, this is also Riverside, by the way. Um, this was a healthy hillside. Uh, it's not healthy anymore, of course. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you can you can see what what's kind of obvious here. Uh, in attempting to show the scale, I did a bunch of aerial photographs, again, from a drone to try to get a different perspective on what the forest looks like. Um, all these beautiful white trees are, are, are gone. Um, and it's hard to see in this, you know, in a Zoom call, but there's actually a little bit of a stream running through the middle of it. Um, and in the video, you can see the stream actually runs. Uh, what we don't see are healthy trees. Uh, another overhead showing erosion. Uh, this particular hillside, probably 60% of it has eroded. So what we wind up with is uh, yellow clay. Um, and that will just continue to erode because there's nothing really growing there of any significance to prevent uh, any sort of erosion. Uh, you'll see this sort of activity all the time. Um, we have these trees, um, some of which are just clearly burned. Um, some have fallen down. So what will happen after a fire, and it can be several years after a fire in, in the case of this particular picture, is the root systems get burned during the fire. They're standing for quite a while, and then all of a sudden they start falling down. Um, it's called, it's a scientific concept called tree mortality. And they actually measure uh, how long it takes for these trees to fall down. Uh, it's very, very important when you're trying to open up a new, uh, a, a new trail or recreation site, as, as you'll see a little bit later. So you'll just see a lot of this with trees sort of going every which way. Some of them will blow down um, after the fire, some of which actually blow down during the fire. Um, another example of the same, in this case, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, healthy forest. Unfortunately, there's a fair amount of unhealthy forest as well. Uh, at the very bottom of this screen, uh, the ground had eroded and a bunch of trees there had just, uh, you know, fallen down. The other thing, it, 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 again, it, it may be a little bit hard to see, but in the uh, left-hand side to the upper area, there's one tree which has been snapped off. Um, again, that's what happens when uh, these trees uh, die and the winds come along and, and they just snap them right in half. I put this in for Mike and Jim and Susan. This is uh, uh, Beachy Creek. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's the Nespeth Trail. Um, frankly, it's here because I just think it's a lovely picture. And I thought that everyone would enjoy it. Um, so uh, this is an example of what ha what a fire does to a waterway. Um, these trees, they're all gone. Um, but we had this beautiful uh, uh, river flowing through here. Um, and unfortunately, when the trees uh, burned, in many cases, they'll fall into the river uh, and that will start clogging up the rivers. Uh, you get a lot of sediment, you got a lot of um, ash in the rivers and so forth. And that can pretty significantly affect the wildlife. So for example, uh, one of the things the fish biologists look at is what is the recovery of uh, certain species of fish in the, uh, in the rivers? And in this particular example, um, they were looking at um, uh, brown trout and uh, 
Chinook salmon. Um, and what they found is after a fire, the number of juvenile fish grows very significantly. It grows both in terms of the number of fish as well as in the size of fish. So the juveniles actually do very well. Unfortunately, the adult fish do not do well. And you'll see a significant drop off on that. So when I'm out there in the forest, I'll stop and talk to the fishermen. And the question is always, you know, what are you seeing? How's the population? And the answer is almost always the same, which is, well, there's lots of little ones, but there ain't no big ones anymore. Um, so that's, uh, so there's a bunch of scientists working to try to understand uh, why that happens. And there's all sorts of theories, uh, but there's some very conflicting uh, studies and they're trying to figure out really what's going on there. And, and that may inform, you know, what they can do to help support the population of these fish. This is a beautiful campsite, by the way, which is no longer a campsite. Um, when a tree, uh, when you have a dead tree, it's a snag called a snag. Uh, you see a lot of these. I think it's a good example of what happens to a tree and the surrounding area. So that's what that's there for. This was the Lookout Fire of last year. Um, Lookout Fire burned 26,000 acres uh, along the Mackenzie River, Lane County, I think it was. Um, what's interesting about this is the, the fire was a ground fire, meaning the flames never got all that high. The trees may have survived or maybe not, only time will tell. But the concern here, of course, is that the root systems have been burned. Um, and these trees may or may not make it. They may fall over. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with them. Um, but there's a lot of study going on right now to try to figure that out and what to do about it. This is an example of where the Bureau of Land Management comes in and um, tries to clear out a lot of the dead wood um, because A, it's a hazard, and B, to try to reopen some recreation sites. Um, they do have loggers come in. Uh, the BLM does auction off burn forest wood. Uh, it's standing and the loggers will come in and, and take it down, but some of it's just not useful. It has no commercial value, so it just gets stacked up. Um, interesting enough, um, with this excess wood called slash, uh, the Bureau of Land Management is now burning it in something called a pyrolyzer, which um, it looks like a dumpster, but the fire in there with the burn in there is a high velocity, low oxygen burn environment. So what it does, it reduces these uh, the wood to a state of pure carbon. And it's referred to as biochar. And when you look at it, it's absolutely pure black granules. Um, the advantage of biochar, we think, is it can be spread on farmland, forest land, even your garden at your home, and it will help to retain moisture uh, and nutrients in the soil. So hopefully it makes the soil a lot more um, beneficial to, you know, things that are trying to grow there. So, um, yeah, so they're in the process of figuring this out. They've done a bunch of studies. They've created a bunch of biochar, and hopefully in the next year or two, we'll see some, some updated results of the studies. But it's, it's a hopeful sign. This is the Fish Creek Trail, enormously popular trail. Um, it went all the way up to Indian Henry, Indian Henry Campground. This is at Riverside, by the way, uh, again, south of uh, Estacada. Um, but this is what trails look like, you know, after fires. Um, the important thing to know about this is even though the trails close, people walk on it, they'll take their dogs on it and kids, et cetera. These areas are very, very unstable. Uh, trees will fall, soil will erode. It's, it's just not an area you really, you really want to be in. Um, nonetheless, there's a picture here. So, uh, another example, this was a beautiful stream that was uh, providing spawning ground, um, no longer. Uh, we see a lot of pictures um, of 
these trees that have these beautiful white branches, uh, very, very tiny branches, um, yet the trunks are burned. So the obvious question is, you know, why is that? And the answer in many cases is there was fire on the ground, but the fire actually never went up the trees. But the fire was so intense that it essentially destroyed the trunks and the little tiny branches without actually the fire uh, reaching there. So this will um, help scientists understand what was happening there. And hopefully it informs, again, forest management practices or uh, uh, potential recovery efforts. So in my view, it's a beautiful picture, but it's a beautiful picture of something that's devastating. Last picture. Um, again, what we have here is healthy forest, not healthy forest. Um, we have an area which has been closed. If you look in the lower left, you'll see the white, or the, I'm sorry, the yellow gate with the sign. Uh, that was a trail, very popular trail. It's now closed. And of course, sort of on, sort of toward the right, again, down at the bottom, you'll see the tree with the X on it. That's yet another tree that's coming down uh, because four years later, it's been determined that it's, it's uh, a hazard. So, that's a look at what I'm doing. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, there's a lot more to come. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. So, Don, I think it's back to you. Don? I can't hear you. Larry, can you turn off your screen share? Yeah. Don is muted. Muted. Let me start oh, over. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, thank you for sharing such an educational and compelling presentation. Um, I learned a lot that I did not know, and I feel so sad about the uncertainty. And it will be really interesting to see what happens in the future. Uh, especially for our grandchildren, you know, and it, it's really great work that you're doing. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions or comments you'd like to ask? Yeah, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to make a few comments about, uh, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Michael and Susan and Jim for uh, uh, going back to Opal Creek and uh, giving us an update uh, on what it looks like now and what what the future holds. Um, a couple of things about the um, about Larry's uh, presentation. Um, I think we have to be really careful about what we call healthy and unhealthy forest. Uh, just because um, the trees are are dead, it doesn't mean it's an unhealthy forest. It means it's starting over. And we also have to be really careful about what we call weeds, because I was involved with the Cottonwood Fire in uh, the, the Tahoe National Forest, and the um, it was it was a very hot fire, burned all of the nitrogen out of the soil. Uh, a lot of it was stand replacing fires where all the trees were were burned, and what came back was tobacco brush, and the Forest Service called them weeds and insisted that they had to get rid of them so that the trees would grow. Well, as it turns out, uh, tobacco brush is a great nitrogen fixer. And so it takes nitrogen from the air with the help of symbiotic fungi and bacteria. It brings nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, you know, we were told that uh, these nasty weeds were going to take all the water away from the trees that were planted and that you know the trees would just wilt and and die well what we found was that the temperatures underneath the tobacco brush were 40 degrees cooler than out in the sun and uh, due to our our efforts um stopping the herbicide uh, project they the trees after about five years overtopped the Cianothus, and that uh, forest 
was uh, on its way to becoming a forest again. Um, uh, another thing that um, we have to be careful about it in, in really hot fires is that the entire, almost the entire nutrient capital, especially in nutrient poor forests, is in the trees. And you take the trees off site by either logging or this um, uh, concept of uh, removing them and putting them somewhere else. You've just taken all the nutrient capital that uh, nature provides and moved it somewhere else. So uh, I'm not saying that. Um, you know we're, uh, that that the increase in stand replacing fires is a good thing, but we know that the Eagle Creek fire was basically an ecologically uh, a beneficial fire. Culturally, not so good. We know that um, uh, our, our Cascade Locks businesses, uh, some of them lost lost their businesses because because of lost revenue. Uh, we we weren't able to hike the trails because of debris on it. And you know, uh, you know that that that's that's a reality. But we also have to look at the process by which the forest will regenerate trees. And um, uh, just because you know the trees aren't on the site doesn't mean it's unhealthy. It's at a different stage. But that, I, I I appreciate uh, seeing your photographs. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions around. To your point, you know, is the expectation that what we want to regrow is what we had before. And that seems to be something of an important question, because as you say, it doesn't, if we're willing to accept something different, it may be more beneficial in the same sense or in different senses, particularly when it comes to things like carbon sequestration, right? Yeah, so, I think there's a, uh, let me admit that there's a lot of unknowns, and there's a lot of things yeah. that I don't know. So uh, I think research and study is absolutely essential. We have to do it if, if we want to uh, uh, live comfortably in this new world that we're living in. Yeah. Well, I have, there is a question in chat. Does producing biochar re biochar release more CO2 into the atmosphere? That's a good question. Um, no. So what happens with biochar is that because of the burn environment in biochar, the, the burn temperatures are very, very hot. The air is moving very, very quickly. And there's a minimum of oxygen in that particular burn environment. So what it does is sort of converts the CO2 into a carbon material, a carbon-based material um, that you can actually, you know, you can hold it in your hand. It'll make your hands black, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so it, it it's a form actually of carbon sequestration because once you have that biochar, um, it will stay in that form unless something's done to it, like, you know, so they crush it or something, but it'll stay that way for at least thousands of years. So, no, it, you, you would think of it more as it's going to return the carbon, the CO2, uh, to the soil. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Well, it makes sense. Thank you, John, for your question. I thought that was a really good question and a great answer. Yeah. Anyone else? I found it, the whole thing, marvelously interesting. I'm very much a natural history nerd. And so I love the scientific part of it. And the uh, the uh, this last discussion about uh, what we expect for the future what we want what will happen what we whether we want it or not and a whole parallel line was the photography and uh the the photography is absolutely marvelous i really appreciate that also uh, but it is a parallel line you don't have to you have, you don't really have to invest yourself in the in the scientific questions to enjoy the photography right. and I, I like that 
oddly enough, the, the burn forest is really beautiful. Exactly, Mike. Some of those some of those images of the burn forest are just fabulous. I I had the feeling um that we were a little bit like um war photographers in that you know it was sad and traumatic and we had to go yeah but we're here to do something you know you know we had a job to do <laughs> and so you just have to let it go well thank you for doing that <laughs> well it it's been a so far, it's been a wonderful opportunity to photograph in an area where we'd normally not have any opportunity at all. I mean, it, it's it was very, it's been a very special opportunity for us, and also it's very nice being able to you know, to really feel challenged artistically, and then to have something to contribute in the end. Yeah, exactly. I love the uh, before and after pictures that you had been there before, right? And then you came back to those exact spots and take the pictures. That was, you know, really compelling to see that. Well, we have a friend who's a forester for Washington State who said that the Cascades had had intense fires in the 1500s. And so what we were seeing in many places was the recovered forest that it just takes centuries for it to get back to what we prefer. So wow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take that longer view that it will be some lifetimes, but it will come back. One of the things I've been thinking about too, particularly as, as we did this program, is we're having an election coming up and um, hmm. a certain group of people hate the government and doesn't believe the government does anything for for us and i'm just thinking how sad it will be when one more agency after another is underfunded or closed down people don't realize we we contribute the weather to the whole world you know the things that the american government does for us and for the world is pretty amazing most people are completely unaware of it mm -hmm. so i i don't think I, I think I think I can guess I can guess how most of you people are voting, but anyway, it scares me to think that so many people would like to close down the government. Politics, <laughs> <laughs> but it plays a role. It, it, you know, it's huge to to have the scientists funded to go out there and try to figure out what's happening and what's going to happen, and mm. what we can do. Mm -hmm. So can I make a closing statement, Don? <laughs> uh, a lot of the people on the screen here donated uh, reproduction rights to photographs and donated prints for the sales that have supported the Ancient Forest Center. Um, so I just was sitting here thinking, you might be wondering what's happened to those. And I think what's happened to those is they're just kind of on the shelf right now because they've been so preoccupied with this whole problem of just getting the site cleaned up and starting to get things rebuilt. Um, but um, they will continue to be an important resource going into the future. So just to give you an appreciation for that work that's been done in the past already. Mm -hmm. Mike, are they gonna rerun the, uh, the uh, fundraising effort there? Yeah, there's a uh, fundraiser coming up uh, in a couple of weeks in October. Um, is that at the Forestry I think, Center? I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be in Rome when it's happening, so I didn't pay that much attention. Okay. So I apologize. Historical, uh, Historical Society. Oh, oh, Jim says he knows it's going to be at the, yeah, that's right. It's at the Oregon Historical Society. There's a, there's an invitation. If you remind one of us, we can forward it to you. Is there a way that we can send it to the whole group? Can we just put it on the website or something like that? I think that's a good idea. After tonight's presentation, that certainly, I'm sure, has interested a lot of us, uh, a lot of people in the group. 
that might have passed by the invitation or not take particular attention, but you've renewed and stimulated our thinking quite a lot. I appreciate that spirit. And it reminds me that when I got involved in this, it was a hopeless cause. The sales had already been scheduled. <laughs> Nobody was going to stop them. And yet they did get stopped. So yeah, let's let's get behind the Opal Creek Engine Forest Center and keep them going, you know. You're talking about the sales of the login years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There were 22 sales and all of Open Creek Canyon was scheduled to be logged. They were going to come along the ridges and do that whole thing where they set up a, a, a crane at the top of each ridge and cut the big trees and haul them up to the tops of the ridges and drive them out. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a done deal. Uh, people literally laughed at the idea that you would stop the Forest Service <laughs> at that point. Well, at least we got a few more years out of it. Yeah, darn right. <laughs> okay, you guys. Uh, was there anything else anybody wanted to say? Now's your chance. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone, and thank you for a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, we will see you at the next print share on Monday, October 7th. So, good night, and ball <laughs> is here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much, you Thanks, guys. John. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>